All right, so this is going to be an entire video about why false implies true. <laughs> so if you've ever learned about logic in a math class, you've probably seen the notation P implies Q, right? So you could read this as P implies Q or if P then Q, where P and Q are supposed to be statements that could either be true or false. And you've probably seen the following truth table. So here we have P, Q, and P implies Q, and here we have four possibilities. So P could be true or false, and Q could also be true or false. So here we have all four possibilities, and P implies Q, well, if P and Q are both true, then P implies Q is true. If P is true and Q is false, then P implies Q is false. If P is false and Q is true, then P implies Q is true. And if P is false and Q is false, then P implies Q is true. Now most people are completely fine with this truth table, but there's one row that confuses a lot of people, and it's this third row, that false implies true is true. Now one reason that this row confuses a lot of people is just an English language issue. So consider the sentence, if my car is broken, then I will fix it. Now, if I were to say this sentence, really by if and then, a better way, but I really mean is if and only if, right? So say that my car isn't broken, right? That this is false. I don't mean that I could still fix it even if my car is broken, right? So if this were false and true, then by this truth table right here, the, the whole thing could still be true. But I'm not going to fix my car if it's not broken. And maybe it doesn't even make sense to fix a car that's not broken. Maybe, that, maybe it's impossible to fix a car that's not broken. So really, a better way to say this is if and only if my car is broken, then I will fix it. And the way we write if and only if in logic is this sort of double arrows, double arrow. And then this third row right here, the true changes to a false. So that's just one issue people have with this, the sort of English language issue that a lot of the times if we say if then really we mean if and only if. But there's actually a much deeper issue, which is the one I would like to get to, which is just that how could something false imply something true? So I was pretty confused about this uh, for an embarrassingly long amount of time. So what I usually do when I'm really confused about something is I ask my friends what they think. So I talked to the three of my friends who are all very smart, uh, Theo, Naomi, and Ben, and I asked them for how they th think about false implies true. So in this video, I'm gonna present all three of my friends' answers, and we'll get a lot of different perspectives on why false implies true. So the first answer I'm going to talk about is my friend Theo's answer. Okay, so I said, Theo, why does false imply true? And Theo said, consider the following two statements. So P is the statement x is even and y is even. So x and y are two uh, integers, right? And say q is the statement x plus y is even. So p implies q is the statement if x 
is even and y is even, then x plus y is even. Now, I hope you can agree that this statement right here is a true statement, right? Even as just an English language sentence, this is something that makes sense. This is something you could say. If x and even and y is even, then x plus y is even. That's true. So what Theo pointed out is that you can plug in different values for x and y and test if this statement is uh, true or not. So let's start by plugging in x equals 2 and y equals 4, right? In that case, x plus y equals 6. And let's make actually a little truth table here. Okay. So let's see if p is true or not. Okay. So is x even? Yes. Is y even? Yes. So x is even and y is even. So p is true. Now let's check q. x plus y is 6. Is 6 even? Yes. <laughs> so p is true and q is true. And we know that p implies q is also true. So okay. So it seems like our statement is working. Now let's check a spicier, uh, some spicier values of x and y. So if x is 3 and y is 5, then x plus y is 8. So now let's check if p is true. Well, 3 is odd and 5 is odd, so p is false. However, x plus y, which is 8, 8 is even. So q is true. And we know that false implies true. So p implies q is true. So we need for false to imply true in order for sentences like this one to be correct. Um, one way to think about it is that you can think about p implies q. You can think about this as the English language sentence, if p is true, then q is true. Right? That's just the exact same thing we said before. But because I phrased it slightly differently, it's easier uh, to see the false implies true case. Okay, So if p is true, then q is true. But if p is false, then q could still be true anyway, right? So just because p isn't true, that doesn't necessarily mean that q is false. And that's, the, that's the, basically the answer. Let me just plug in one more thing in the truth table here just to sort of round this out. So let's say x was 3 and y was 4. Well, then x plus y would be equal to 7. And here p would be false and q would be false. And p implies q is true, which is good, because our statement p implies q is true. So just as we need for false implies true to be true in order for sentences uh, like this one to be true, we also need for false implies false to be true in order for sentences like these to be true. Now, here we've replicated three rows of the truth table. But there's one row we haven't gotten yet, and that's true implies false, which is false. And no matter what x and y you come up with, you're never going to be able to find an x and y such that uh, you can come up with this row right here. And the reason you can't come up with this row right here is because here p implies q would be false. But the thing is that we know that this sentence here is true. So no matter how hard you try, because our sentence p implies q is true, you won't be able to find an even number x and an even number y such that x plus y is odd. You just can't find it. So when Theo told me this answer, I thought, hmm, yeah. Yeah, I think I get it now. But then after I thought about it, 
for a while longer, I realized that there was still something I was really confused about with why false implies true. So let's think about the following sentence. Okay. If I am eight feet tall, then Donald Trump is president. Okay, so the statement, I am eight feet tall. Well, this is false. And Donald Trump is president. At the time of making this video, this is true. But strangely, we, ha we know that if false, then true is a true statement. So strangely, this whole sentence here is true. Now, the reason that this is confusing is because the statement, I am eight feet tall, and the statement, Donald Trump is president, are causally unrelated statements. They just have nothing to do with each other, right? Donald Trump is president, whether or not I'm eight feet tall. They're just completely separate uh, facts. So when we say P implies Q, don't we really mean that P causes Q? Like, aren't we saying that Q is related to P, that the fate of P and Q are somehow tied together, right? How are we supposed to think about uh, sentences like, if I am eight feet tall, then Donald Trump is president, where the false statement just has nothing to do with the true statement? So after talking to Theo, I then asked Naomi. I said, Naomi, why does false imply true? And here is what she said. She said that P implies Q is not a statement about causation. It is a statement of fact. Right? P implies Q doesn't necessarily have to do with causation. So here's how she said you can think about it. She said that you can think of P implies Q as the following sentence. In all worlds where P is true, Q is true. Now, let me be clear that when I'm saying all worlds, I'm not referencing like the multiverse or anything. Um, you have to sort of specify what you mean by all worlds. Usually we sort of mean all of the worlds that are similar to this one. So think about the following sentence. If I wake up at 9 a.m., I will be late for class. Now, this is really a normal statement uh, that someone could say. And it seems to be a statement about causation, that somehow waking up at 9 a.m. will cause me to be late for class. And in the normal world, you know, this could be because class is at 9.30 a.m. and the bus that I have to take uh, to get to class takes 45 minutes. So if I wake up at 9 a.m., I'll get there at least by 9.45 and I'll definitely be late. So there might be some reason why this is statement is true in the normal world. Now, Naomi says that we should think about this statement as saying, in all worlds where I wake up at 9 a.m., I will be late for class in each of those worlds. Now, these worlds that we're talking about here are normal worlds, right? If it's some crazy world out in the multiverse, and the multiverse, you know, I mean, probably doesn't exist, but you know, whatever. <laughs> There's some crazy world where I have a jetpack, then, you know, this state will be false because then 
what we mean when we say in all worlds is different. But here, the explanatory power, the causation implicit in the sentence, if I wake up at 9 a.m., I'll be late for class, comes from the fact that the worlds which we are referencing are normal worlds and we have some understanding of how normal worlds work. I have to get in the bus and the bus takes 45 minutes. Now, the thing is, is that P implies Q, as I wrote uh, up here, is a statement of fact. So really, it just so happens to be the case that in all normal worlds, when I wake up at 9 a.m., I'll be late for class. If I could just look at each of the worlds that are kind of like the world I live in, I could just observe this fact that if I wake up at 9 a.m., I'll be late for class. This is a fact, right? And the reason that we usually think about uh, P implies Q being causal is because we have some understanding and we know the reason for things. But just because that's often the case doesn't mean it has to be the case, right? In mathematical logic, P implies Q isn't saying anything about because or causation. So let's actually look at another example uh, of a sentence. So think about the sentence this is something you could read in a newspaper article, for example. If we ban assault weapons, then there will be fewer gun related deaths, right? Now, what this sentence is claiming is that in all possible worlds, which are similar to ours, the worlds in which we happen to ban assault weapons are also going to be worlds in which gun-related deaths decrease. And there can be some sort of causal relationship uh, between these two facts. But really, this is just sort of a statement of fact about all of the similar worlds in which we happen to have banned assault weapons. So you may have noticed that it can be really difficult to pin down uh, causation, you know, in life, in science and philosophy. You know, there are sometimes people make statements like, um, if there are more abortions, then crime will go down. This is a pretty difficult statement to evaluate the truth of. You know, if you really think about it, like, yeah, maybe that's right. And you think about it more like, wait, I don't know. But how can you really, like, say for sure? Like, philosophically, establishing a causal link between, you know, two things um, is really difficult. But in mathematical logic, P implies Q doesn't really get into that, right? It's not as complicated as causation is in real life and in, you know, science and philosophy, in which case it's pretty difficult to establish that something causes something else. But we're not really worrying about that in mathematical logic. Philosophically speaking, the reason why it's very difficult to establish causation in science is because you have to control for every independent variable. In other words, you have to really know what all of the similar worlds are like, right? You have to know what all worlds are like. So you can observe, you know, for instance, that abortion rates have gone up or something, and you can observe that crime has gone down. But maybe there's some other reason why crime went down. You know, there's, it's kind of tough to control for everything. In some sense, you never really know that you've finished controlling for everything. All you can do is be incredibly persistent. But philosophically speaking, you never totally know that you've controlled for all possible similar worlds. So it's very difficult in real life to establish causation. Um, by the way, I hope I haven't you know, offended anybody who thinks anything about abortion in this video. The point is I'm trying to find 
messy if then statements in order to make my point about how messy they can be. You know, I don't want to make anyone upset. <laughs> so because, you know, the real world is very complicated, let's go back to sort of our simple uh, mathematical sentences. So let's consider the sentence in all worlds where x is even and y is even, x plus y is even, right? So here uh, are two statements, uh, x is even and y is even, and x plus y is even. These two statements are related to each other. They both depend on x and y, right? There's some deeper structure relating these two statements together. And it's, these, it's this deeper structure uh, that we know about. You know, we know about integers and how they add and how when you add two even integers, the sum is even. Right? It's this deeper structure that makes us say, you know, that this is a causal statement. And most, you know, proofs in math are like this. They are sort of causal, but it's usually because there's some deeper structure in the statement rather than just, you know, whether things are true and false. You know, if I am eight feet tall, then Donald Trump is president, right? Usually there's a deeper relation between the things that sort of puts the causation uh, into it, right? And usually in math, you know, instead of saying in all worlds, right, usually you would say for all choices of x and y, right? That would really replace our in all worlds clause. Here, instead of thinking about, you know, <laughs> all worlds, whatever that means, we're, we're thinking about all the different integers we could think about, which is much uh, easier to think about. <laughs> all right, so having said all of that, there's another sentence uh, I want to look at. So, for all choices of x and y, right, this is our in all worlds, uh, if 1 equals 0, then x plus y equals x plus y, right? So here we know that 1 equals 0 is always false, no matter what we choose for x and y. And here we know that x plus y always equals x plus y, no matter what we choose for x and y. So this is always true. So here we have if false, then true, and we know that this whole thing is true, right? Now, this is sort of the mathematical equivalent to the sentence, if I am eight feet tall, then Donald Trump is president, right? Because there are no worlds in which I am eight feet tall, and likewise, there are no choices of x and y for which one equals zero. So because we can never find a choice of x and y for which one equals zero, we never, really, we never even really get to the step of evaluating whether or not x plus y uh, equals x plus y, right? We can never even find a world where one equals zero. So the question of whether we can find a world where x plus y equals x plus y is a moot uh, question. So this is sort of the last confusion I have about false implies true. And this is where Ben's answer is gonna come in, right? My confusion at this point is why should we still say uh, false implies true when we can't find even a single world in which, you know, one equals zero or I am eight feet tall, right? Why is it still then fair to say if I, or sorry, why is it still fair to say if one equals zero, then x plus y equals x plus y, right? If we can't even find one world in which one equals zero. So let's all say thank you to Naomi <laughs> for a wonderful answer. That's really the heart uh, of the answer, I think.
But now we're going to talk about Ben's answer. And in my opinion, Ben's answer is really interesting. So what Ben did is Ben went all the way back to Aristotle, who was one of the first people to really think about logic. So here's uh, what Ben said. So according to Ben, for Aristotle, logic was all about categories. Um, and I assume, you know, Aristotle used a Greek word. I don't know which Greek word he used. But really, when we say categories, we sort of mean the modern notion of sets, basically. Um, so Aristotle thought a lot about statements like all humans are mortal. So here we can think uh, in this statement, we can think of all humans as a set, the set of all humans, and all mortals as a set, the set of all mortals. So what this statement is really saying is that the set of all humans, which I'll just call humans, is contained, this is the symbol uh, for contained, the set of all humans is contained in the set of all mortals. Another way to say this in modern you know, notation is that if X is an element of the set of all humans, this implies that X is an element of the set of all mortals. And here, uh, this little E sort of means X is an element of, i.e. X is in the set uh, of all humans. So for Aristotle, implies and contains are really the same thing. Now, let's consider two sets. Let's think about the two sets. So now let's think about the two sets nothing and everything. All right, so by nothing, I sort of mean like uh, what you would call now the empty set. This is just the set with no elements in it, right? The set with nothing in it. So actually, Aristotle didn't really think of uh, the empty set as a set or a category. Um, so now we're sort of going beyond Aristotle a little bit. So the statement X is an element of nothing, this statement is always false right? because no element is an element of nothing and the statement x is an element of everything right? this statement is always true Now, in modern times, we would usually say that nothing, the empty set, is contained in any other set, right? So, for instance, nothing is contained in mortals. And we would also say that mortals is contained in everything, right? So this is the normal way that we talk about set theory now. It's not the way Aristotle thought about it. Aristotle didn't really think that the empty set was contained in any other set. But now, you know, we modern people have discovered the utility of thinking that the empty set is contained in every other set. So, um, so in particular, 
we know that nothing is contained in everything. And as we discussed previously, this statement is equivalent to the statement If x is an element of nothing, then x is an element of everything. So, because this here is always false, that x is an element of nothing, and this right here is always true, that x is an element of everything, we now have a new way to think about what confused me so much, right? So let's just remember uh, what confused me. So let me move this uh, up here. Whoops. And let me move this up here. And let me paste the confusing statement uh, I had earlier. So previously what confused me was for all choices of x and y, if 1 equals 0, then x plus y equals y, x plus y. <laughs> now, this, what's going on in this sentence is the same exact thing that's going on uh, in this thing right here. For all choice, there, for, okay, the choices of x and y for which 1 equals 0 is nothing. It is the empty set. And the choices of x and y for which x plus y equals x plus y is everything. So, the, th the thing that makes uh, this statement right here true is exactly what Aristotle <laughs> uh, didn't think was true himself. He didn't really consider the fact that the empty set was a subset of the entire set. But in order for, if, if you want the empty set to be the subset of every other set, which is a very good thing to have in general, you're going to have stuff like this uh, happening, right? It's just a natural consequence. But I think it's also interesting the fact that uh, Aristotle didn't really think in these terms. It shows that there is something counterintuitive about it. And just to really hammer in this point, everything, right, the set that I've been calling everything, is equal to the set of all worlds, right? So when we choose what we mean when we say in all worlds, what we're really doing is we're choosing what do we mean by the set everything. Anyway, that's everything I have to say about why false implies true. Thank you for watching. <laughs> I hope you have benefited from all the wisdom of my very intelligent friends, Theo, Naomi, and Ben just as I have been able to benefit over the years. I think each answer has really brought a new depth of understanding to you know, why false implies true, but also the relationship between mathematical logic and intuitive logic, the way we use it uh, in real life. I think it's a confusing subject, and it's really worth thinking about fully. So.